they'll come in and the couple will tell me a story about her hitting him. And I'll look at them both and say, you know, that's not okay. And, and I've at times gotten this look from women like, no, it's okay. You know, I, I get to do that. Um, yeah. And, and it's not okay. So we have to, we have to change that. Ann Silvers is the author of Abuse of Men by Women. It happens, it hurts, and it's time to get real about it. Ann is a counselor and relationship coach based in Gig Harbor, Washington, near Tacoma. She has decades of experience working with women and men as couples and individuals, and she's authored many self-help books, including Abuse of Men by Women, which I've included links to in the video description. Thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, as you know, we'll be covering several topics, including the abuse of men by women, your experiences counseling abusers and victims, the Duluth model of domestic violence intervention, and the idea of having government men's commissions. So before we get into that, uh, could you explain your background and the experiences that you bring to this discussion? Sure, yeah. So I'm a counselor. I've uh, been in private practice for 20 years. I my background is that my first career was not counseling. My first career was microbiology. And um, I got interested in therapy when I finally had my own therapy and had such great results from it, felt so much better that I decided I wanted to become a counselor. So eventually I went back to school and did all the degrees to get through to the master's level and get, get my counseling degrees. While I was doing that, um, you know, so I was in my 30s and 40s, and um, I did a minor in women's studies actually at the University of Washington when I did my bachelor's of science in psychology. And um, it's kind of a, at that time, it was kind of a minor in abuse of women by men. Uh, I think it's different possibly now. I kind of looked at it recently to see what their, their curriculum is. It seems, it seems to have broadened. Uh, but that's kind of what it was. And um, I, when I was in private practice, I began to notice that their men were being abused. And actually, the biggest thing that woke me up was a male friend was started telling me stories about his marriage. And I kind of minimized them at first, thought he was exaggerating, and then realized, no, this his wife's abusive. And that made me kind of reflect back. I'd only been in private practice a short time, but I reflected back and I thought, I think I'm missing this. And I started talking about it. I started talking about uh, women abusing men. And like I talk about it at a party and men would come out of the woodwork to tell me their stories. And everywhere I went, if I brought up the topic, people would kind of gasp <laughs> and then nod their head yeah. <laughs> and so I, and I got really frustrated by the lack of resources. Nobody was really publicly talking about it or not many people. And if I had a guy who was being abused, I, ha I basically had nowhere to send him for more information or support. So that's why I wrote the book, Abuse of Men by Women. And um, when I was talking to people about it, about that topic, I realized that I had to really accentuate the of. So abuse of men by women, because when I said abuse of men, people actually heard abusive men because they're so used to that one directional view of partner abuse. So that's, that's how I got into it. I see. Okay. And that book, Abuse of Men by Women, came out in 2014. How has the uh, response to that book been since then? Um, it, it keeps selling. Um, I, the, um, the Johnny Depp story, I think, is really currently raising awareness about women abusing men. And um, so that stimulates some interest in the book in the last year or so. Um, and I, I have, you know, for somebody who's self-published and I'm not paying people to do uh, reviews and things like that, like the, you know, the big publishing houses have their reviewers that they can splash up reviews. But I got 84 reviews on Amazon, which is for self-publishers a good number. 
and um, it's 80% five stars. And I just got in, in the last little while, I noticed my first one star review. Uh, you know, clearly somebody who's ticked about the topic. <laughs> and um, I've actually been surprised I haven't had more of those along the way. I certainly get negative feedback at times if I speak publicly, like if I speak to counselors about the topic. I'll get a, a lot of people nodding their head in agreement and, and eager to be educated. And then invariably, some people who are become really angry with the idea that I'm talking about this. You have a really useful blog and you've written a lot of blog posts about a wide variety of things. Of course, uh, it, it's not as if all that you talk about or the only kind of stuff that you work on is this issue of abuse yeah. uh, of men by women. But I, I did particularly um, read some of your posts about that topic. And so I'll ask you about a couple of them. Sure. Um, one, you've written that patriarchy isn't the only reason or even the main reason for partner abuse. Could you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I think that that is uh, an old idea that it's just hanging around way too long. This uh I, you know, I think when we go back in time or we have, if we look at countries that have a very strong pat patriarchal system, that is certainly a factor in, in abuse in relationships. But when I was, you know, trying to come up with, you know, what do, actually creating a list of reasons why people might abuse their partner, um, I came up with 72 reasons. And I, and I talk about each one of them gets a, at least a page in, in my book. Um, so there could be mental illnesses, so it could be narcissism, it could be borderline personality disorder. We, say, we see that a lot um, in, in practice. Um, could be other mental illnesses or personality disorders. I see anxiety often drives controlling, demanding behavior that is abusive. Um, it could be that somebody is raised in an abusive household, so that's modeled for them and they, and they utilize those same techniques. It could be the opposite. It could be somebody was actually pedestalized as a child. So somebody who's treated as um, a princess or, um, you know, the, it could be the head of the football team, you know, the football star in high school, they, they get this ego that turns into uh, abusiveness, potentially. Um, again, controlling, demanding behaviors. Ab abuse is controlling, punishing, or demeaning. That's, that's, the, that's the drivers behind um, abusive behaviors and attitudes. So there's a lot of different reasons why people, you know, another one that comes to substance abuse can it often be a factor in it as well. So there's some of the, besides patriarchy, which I think it really skews the whole discussion as if, um, as, as if it can only happen, you know, when you use that as your, as your central premise for partner abuse, well, then it can only happen in one configuration mental disorders like anxiety or depression, those are easier to help people make changes around than personality disorders like narcissism or borderline personality disorder. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of times when a person would do well to work on individual counseling as well as couples counseling. So in the couples counseling, you can really address. And what I typically uh, focus a lot on is emotion skills. So you're um, learning about overreactions and anger and how to deal with them better and um, communication skills. So how to say what you have to say with tact, which is a combination of honesty and respect, how to listen well, because um, most people are very frustrated by not really feeling heard by their partner and then how to consult. So problem solve for win-win. Um, those are keys that can really help. And then if somebody's coming from a place of 
they're just mean, <laughs> then, the, the, you know, I can teach the best skills ever. But if their motivation is coming from a mean place, and I'm not saying that that abuse always does, it sometimes does, um, then, you know, you can't, that's, they'll just weaponize the new skills. In your blog post about reasons people stay in abusive relationships, one of the reasons is denial. And you write, this is especially true for male targets of abuse by women and LGBTQ targets because there's widespread cultural denial of partner abuse in any configuration other than male to female. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So the it a person just can't get their head around that they could be being abused if there's they've been trained to think about that it, it can only happen in one direction. It could only be male to female. So then if they're in a relationship, they're a guy who's being mistreated, they're not going to see it as abuse. They're going to, they're going to keep searching for, you know, what am I doing wrong? What, what I must be causing this. Uh, it can't possibly be her. It must be me because the culture keeps, or, you know, and there's this tendency in abusive relationships to make excuses for the other person. And um, abuse can come in cycles. So it's not always constant. It can be a cycle of increasing tension. There's an abusive uh, occurrence or event. Then there is a decrease in tension, followed by an increase in tension, another abusive event, followed by a decrease in tension. And doesn't always happen like that, uh, and it, but it can. This is another factor in the denial because you keep getting hooked back in. It, it's it's not that bad kind of thing. And I think for you know it happens to women who are being abused by men as well, and just kind of I see it exaggerated. This this blindness, this inability to see what's really happening, both by the women who are being abusive to men and the men who are being abused. So it's not only um, men who've been trained with that kind of mindset, uh, being unable to see that they are victims, but also women being trained with that mindset, unable to see that they are perpetrating abuse. Yeah, for sure. I mean, not everybody who comes to counseling who's an abusive person is ever open to you know, recognizing that in themselves. Some people are not, okay? What I've noticed is um, in particular, people who their abuse is driven by anxiety, those are some of the people I have the best results with. Because when I can, they, they often will come in thinking that their demands and their controlling behavior toward their partner, which is, which is driven by the tension they have inside of themselves because of their anxiety, they're not really looking at it as a bad thing, you know, as something they need to change. They're looking at their partner needs to change so they're not so stressed. And, and those people I have the best results with in terms of being able to open their eyes so that they can see, you know, they are actually responsible for addressing the anxiety inside of them. And, and then these relationships often will have, you know, make great strides in terms of becoming healthy and happy. And I do want to address the LBGTQ separately too. I kind of, you know, culturally we are so not talking about this. And I think in a way the, the LGBTQ community is hesitant to publicly talk about it because there's so much um, animosity towards the community that they, you know, they really it stifles them. They don't want to add to the negative perceptions. And so that holds them back um, from talking to people about it who might be helpful. You know, it adds to their denial. They're, you know, they're, they want to deny that this could be happening to them. And then the blindness from nobody's talking about it or very few people are talking about it. So it's hard to recognize. It's hard enough for a woman, you know, we've been talking a long time, uh, you know, a good 50 years, we've been talking about more and have more openness around men 
when men abuse women and how unhealthy that is and we need to change that we need to not accept that that kind of stuff it's still hard for women inside of those relationships to see um because of denial and uh this just can't be happening kind of thing and similar things it must be me i can change something i can get through to them um and i just see it it's bad enough in those situations when it's male to female. It's worse when it's the other gender configurations because we add that cultural blindness. I see. Okay. Yeah. And if they do reach out, they're often not helped. Um, you know, the, the organizations that are around for helping people in partner abuse situations are geared towards situations where men are abusing women. And I know of stories where men have reached out to those organizations and they get treated like an abuser. You've heard stories like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that just makes them feel more like, oh, it must, you know, it must be me. Okay. Yeah. I think we can send subtle signals in a way that, that does uh, convey kind of who's, who's, whose space this is and whose space this isn't. Oh. And to me, I, I notice even things like that the, the color scheme of the National Domestic Violence Hotline website. Yeah, pink and purple. Wow. And um, someone said at, at one point something that resonated with me, which was, uh, "You don't have to ban men from any particular space, but if you just put a bunch of feminine kinds of decorations or make it a pink space, men are not going to come there because we men do have insecurities about their masculine masculinity sometimes, and we do feel uncomfortable often in like uh, very female dominated spaces, and so." If you make the National Domestic Violence Hotline full of pinks and purples, it just, I could see men having a perception that I don't think I, this space is for me. Right, I, I, I'm so glad to hear you say that because when I, when I graduated um, from the University of Washington with my degrees, before I set out into get, doing the master's degree at a different university, I realized that when I went into private practice, I really wanted to help men. And, and I won't get into the whole story. Well, I will mention it's because I wrote, read the book, I Don't Want to Talk About It. And it's about men and depression. It's, it's a great book for men. And, and so I realized that when I went into private practice, I really wanted to help men. I felt like uh, there's lots of people who help women. And it's, it's sort of the easier road in, in many ways. Men are more hesitant about reaching out for help. There's a lot of man law things that come into play. And um, so I noticed what you're talking about. I, I noticed that counseling websites often had butterflies and lots of pink and things like that. And in my master's degree, I was given an assignment of go interview a counselor, you know, somebody working in the field. And we had a set of questions to ask. So I met up with this counselor at her office and she had this cute house that she had her office in and she used to be an interior designer. Okay. So you walk in and it's a beautiful setting, but it's got lace curtains and a floral, you know, really dramatic floral print on the, on the couch in the waiting room. And I thought just what you were saying, I thought a man is gonna walk into this space, not necessarily identify why they're uncomfortable, but just be uncomfortable. So I've really tried to have um, neutral color, like um, I have used bold reds and blue and blues and uh, in my branding. I'm a big fan of the TV show, The Office. And that was made between 2003, uh, sorry, 2005 and 2013. And uh, when I was recently rewatching it, I noticed that one of the characters, her name is Angela. She's a petite blonde woman. And she has a habit of, of hitting men when she's angry with them. And I saw that in a new light when I rewatched it recently. Um, throughout the series, nothing is ever made of Angela's violence toward men. Uh, but I think the, the plot would have probably treated the situation differently if the sexes were switched in situations like that. So um, it seems like we have some room for improvement when it comes to media depictions of women who punch, slap, kick or throw drinks in the face of men's uh in the face of men when they're feeling upset would you agree with that 
Yes, and I'm glad to hear you notice it. I, I'm really frustrated by the amount of times we see that depicted, that a um, woman hitting a man. And not only is it okay, it's like emboldened, it's, it's applauded, it's laughed at. It shows up a lot in romantic comedies. Um, and like Fool's Gold is a, is a romantic comedy with, um, oh, I'm forgetting her name, Goldie Hawn's daughter, Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey. And um, I, I just watched it again. And, and you know, she hauls off and, and hits him really hard. And, and it's just supposed to be okay. And um, it shows up in commercials. There was a, I wrote about it in my book. It was around the time I was writing the book. There was a commercial of a woman throwing a can of soda at a guy. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's seen as so okay. It's part of a commercial. Like this is supposed to sell their product. Um, and it's even at the end of the movie Frozen. There, the, so the children's movie, the, the girl hauls off and hits the guy so hard that he falls off like a dock and, and, and into the water. Now he's, he's done some bad things. So I'll, you know, I'll give them that. But considering that children are watching this movie 200 times, you know, and they're very impressionable. And so there's this whole thing about somehow that's okay. And, and if we're gonna justify somebody hitting somebody else, I mean, that's exactly what's wrong in partner abuse is the person in their mind, they're justifying doing this thing. In their mind, this is okay. And, um, you know, until they would potentially learn to learn something different. Like, so, you know, I've seen this in women when, you know, they'll come in and the couple will tell me a story about her hitting him. And I'll look at them both and say, you know, that's not okay. And, and I've at times gotten this look from women like, no, it's okay. You know, I, I get to do that. Um, yeah. And, and it's not okay. So we have, to, we have to change that. And I think a great test is, is what you mentioned is imagine the genders are reversed. Would it be seen as okay then? And if it wouldn't be okay for a guy to hit a woman in that way, like knock her down, um, then it's not okay for a woman to hit a guy like that. What differences do you find in general between counseling male uh, perpetrators specifically of partner abuse and female perpetrators of partner abuse? Yeah, and I, and I don't specialize in domestic violence. So I, in fact, um, if, if they're court mandated, um, I, I don't work with them because I work out of my house. And so I just don't feel like if, if it's escalated to that place, um, that's really not even a safe thing for me to be inviting into my home. Um, so, uh, I actually screen those out and, um, uh, so I don't end up working that often with active cases of like domestic violence where somebody is, is hitting the other person. Um, and the ones that I do end up work with are probably more where the woman is abusive, um, because, they're not in the system, you know, oh. they're, they, um, it's more likely that it comes up in counseling as um, neither of them really recognizing how bad it is. And it could be things like, you know, like this, all, all the seven kinds of uh, partner abuse. Uh, there's, there's sexual, there's physical, there's verbal, there's um, emotional, psychological, there's legal, there's financial, they're spiritual. Okay. Um, so, you know, physical is just one, one type, but some of the ways that, you know, physical can show up in, in a relationship is like one person grabbing the steering wheel when somebody, when the other person is driving and grab the steering wheel in a way, like they're going to pull them off the road. They're, they're going to make the car go off the road. Um, and that's the kind of thing that can kind of just all of a sudden get mentioned in counseling because they didn't really realize 
how bad that was um, somehow. And again, probably because it's something, if we're not talking about it culturally, it, it's not on their radar and, and they know that they're scared in the moment, but then they just kind of move on to the next moment when, when it's over kind of thing. But it can be part of a pattern of that aggressive kind of um, abusive behaviors. I hadn't thought about yanking the steering wheel being an instance of putting the physical safety of a partner at risk in a similar way that you're actually harming the physical well-being of a partner. Yeah, yeah. So when when women are abusing men physically, it's often in situations where the man um, is more vulnerable. So when they're driving, so she might hit him while while he's driving. He you know can't really defend himself. Um, Pulling the steering wheel is another one. And although I've had it happen where a man pulls the steering wheel on, on a woman as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, another situation where women overcome their size differential when they're physically abusing men is to, you know, surprise. So when they're sleeping, um, had a guy who woke up in the middle of the night by being hit by the clock radio. Uh, his wife hit him cut cut him at the side of his eye and um luckily for him he knew enough to flee and so he 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 could get his car keys and flee and call the police from from um a removed position um and so and women you know heard lots of stories about women um attacking men from behind you know jumping up on their back clawing at their face, the fingernails, um, that kind of stuff. And um, also happens because men are trained to not hit women. So, you, you know, you might look at some big guy and think, well, he can't possibly be hurt by a, a woman hitting him. But um, if he won't hit back, which, you know, I don't advocate for anybody to hit back, but that's one of the ways that women can then, they can be relatively small, but pounding on a guy um, who's just trying to, you know, protect himself as best he can, but not hit back. She can get a lot of blows in. Yeah, and it's, it's tough because he has to be careful not to hit back for, for multiple reasons. Yeah, your car example resonates with me in my personal experience, mm, sort of in a, um, a bizarre way where the relationship that I was in that had uh, one way abuse perpetrated by uh, the woman I was in a relationship with towards me. Uh, at one point, she attacked me while she was driving. So she's at the wheel and then she's punching while we're going 40 miles per hour in a two lane road around a corner. Oh, wow. So like a very unsafe situation to take your hands off the wheel and be punching someone as you are driving a car. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's and the first time, maybe I put a, a first time of that particular one uh, on your radar. <laughs> yeah, again, another situation where you can't defend yourself and it ups the abusiveness because, you know, the terror you would, I, I can only really imagine the terror you'd feel because you're definitely in a life and death situation where you could be killed in that moment. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Thanks. And I'm glad that you're not in that relationship anymore. Right. I appreciate it. So you have read and heard the personal testimonies of many abused males and females. I imagine some of those reviews and emails that you've gotten in response to your blog posts and your book, mm -hmm. Abuse of Men by Women, have shared those testimonies. Are there any differences you've noticed between the experience of being a male victim of partner abuse compared with the experience of being a female victim of partner abuse? Well, I, I think that the, you know, one of the biggest things is the blindness to it. So if we were to back up 50, 50 years to where we were in denial about um, the harm done to women in abusive relationships, um, and we can look back at that and we can all look at that and go, that's bad. <laughs> you know, that was a bad time. Um, I can remember as a child, this kind of whispers around 
um, women in, t in town who were, you know, everybody knew that they were being abused. Nobody did anything about it. And um, it's, I, I don't even think we're doing the whispering when it comes to men being abused. We're not even there. Um, um, so that blindness makes it just so hard for men to recognize it. And, and I can have difficulty getting a guy to recognize that what's happening to him is not okay. Um, and, and get, and, you know, assist him to somehow get out of the, the situation. You know, if it's changeable, then okay. It may not be changeable. You know, sometimes the only thing that you can do when you're in an abusive relationship is to get out of it. Because if the other, the, the abusive person doesn't recognize what they're doing as bad, it's not gonna change. We do a disservice to women when we don't recognize that it's harmful for women to abuse men. It's harmful for women to be controlling, demanding, demeaning, punishing, um, and, and, and see it as abuse as, versus seeing it as, it, well, this is just, I get to do this because this is women being empowered. What do you know about how common relationships are in which female perpetrated abuse or specifically violence uh, is present, whether we're talking about nationally or here in Washington state? I don't know a lot. You know, I, I don't really follow the stats. I don't know what to think about stats when it comes to domestic violence. I know that the domestic violence against men um, from women is underreported. There's a lot of reasons for that, you know, part of the male training that you don't need help, that, um, you know, that it would be somehow um, emasculating to ad, uh, admit to yourself or to somebody else that you are being beat up by a woman. Um, so I and, I, and I think too, that there's some potential for the skewing of stats. I know what I've read, is that early on, again, we go back about 50 years and they were doing the first real research into domestic violence. My understanding is that they came up with numbers that were much more similar in terms of um, which direction it was coming from. You know, the, the other thing is it can be mutual. You know, you can have two abusive partners and they're, they're abusing each other. So it can be um, in heterosexual relationship, it could be male to female, it could be female to male, it could be both. Um, and my understanding is that the original statistical research that they were doing uh, came out pretty even. And, and there were forces at play that squashed the results. And, and so I just really, um, I tend to believe that and um, don't tend to know what to think of the stats. So I go back to what do I know? And what I know is male, uh, female to male um, partner abuse in all its forms, including physical violence, happens more often than we think. And it, it's harmful and it's, it's destroying lives. So one way I kind of look at it is different cancers happen at different rates. There's some cancers that are, are you know, percentage of, of how often it happens or how often it kills are higher than another kind of cancer. Um, so like kidney cancer isn't as common as, as let's say, um, oh, what would be another one? Breast cancer comes to mind. Um, so we, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that that's true um, stats wise. But we don't go around saying, well, we're just going to ignore kidney cancer because it doesn't happen as often or it doesn't kill as many people as, as breast cancer. So we'll ignore kidney cancer. We don't do that. We're like, we're both, both need to be talked about, need to be treated, need to be researched. Um, and, and I wish we would look at um, partner abuse similarly, like not do the relative numbers thing because it tends to diminish one in terms of importance. 
Okay, so then, yeah, the question is, how can we get to a more even-minded place where we're not um, ignoring or diminishing one of the problems in favor of highlighting another problem? Uh, would, would government men's commissions, kind of like how we have government women's commissions, be an avenue to do that? Um, I don't know, because um, I've not gotten involved in, in, in government, so I don't know, you know, the nuances of exactly how those things work. Um, I was recently thinking about, well, it's so wonderful that we have now paternity leave. You know, we've moved forward culturally. We've got government things in place to um, recognize it's important for guys to have time with their newborns. And that's a change. That's a cultural change. It's a government change. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking, so some people, there must have been commissions, there must have been some people who were bringing this to the table. So, you know, there's, there's a mechanism and, and maybe this is another topic that, um, you know, whatever avenues brought that, brought paternity leave to the forefront, maybe there's an avenue to bring um, the reality that, you know, part, partner abuse is bad. And it doesn't matter who's doing it to who. It's harmful. And it harms the it harms the person who's the target of the abuse. It harms children that uh, witness the abuse or could, you know, end up in the middle of it. And it and it even hurts the person who is uh, being abusive. I share your uncertainty about what statistics to believe. And um one helpful way that that I, I tend to think is is believable that's been described of what the prevalence is is that uh, if you think of three buckets of types of relationships in which partner abuse is occurring, um, male to female, female to male, and and mutual, and and I believe some studies have shown it's roughly a third, a third, and a third. So that 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 even complicates things more if we say it's it's about fifty percent male, it's about fifty percent male. Uh, female. It's like, yes, but also there's a portion of the relationships in which it goes both directions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the both directions one has been some of the most confusing cases for me when I've got couples I'm working with, because I'm trying to figure out who's doing what to who. And then it you know, suddenly kind of dawns on me after seeing them a few times. Oh, it's both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, regardless of what the actual prevalence is of female to male abuse, if there's an imbalance between um, our mainstream cultural perception and reality, then we want to close that gap. Right, right. And, and we want to have that dis discussion be more about abuse is bad. And it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's not any more acceptable for a woman to hit a guy as a guy to hit a woman. The Duluth model is one of the most common domestic violence intervention programs in the United States. I understand you share some critics' concerns about the Duluth model. Could you talk about what the Duluth model is and what the problems with it are? Yeah. So I just, I know about it by, uh, from reading about it, not from using it. So I'll, I'll give that. Um, and what I read about it is it's based on the concept that there's one reason for domestic violence, and that's the existence of patriarchy. That domestic violence happens because guys feel that they have the right to hit their woman. And, um, and so the Duluth model is based on that, and it became the premise for um, the, the whole approach to helping people stop being abusive and um, stop being abused, you know, uh, both, both like it's, it's used for, um, you know, assisting women to see what's wrong in their relationship if they're being abused by a guy, it's being, being used by um, helping, you know, groups, et cetera, that are, that are set up to help men who are identified, especially in the court system, by of being um, physically abusive. And, and so it looks at that one thing, you know, it's not looking at the, the 71 other reasons why I think partner abuse happens. I mean, there's a fraction 
there's a fraction of guys in the US who think I can hit my woman and that's okay because I'm the guy. I don't think that's a very high percentage of current males in this in the United States. No. There was a time when that was the case, but we got to go back yeah, 50 to 100 years. Equality for Boys and Men focuses on the state of Washington. Do you have any familiarity with the programs of the state of Washington or, or certain counties uh, where you live or nearby? What kind of models that they follow for domestic violence intervention? Actually, no, I, d I don't. Um, yeah. Okay. So the term gender violence, I want to ask you about this. Um, we're approaching the end of the 2021 Washington State Legislative Session now. Okay. I've been following along online, listening to lawmakers, experts, and the general public uh, provide testimony about proposed new laws. Okay. And I noticed that when discussing bills having to do with domestic violence, some people use the term gender violence. And uh, I want to ask, what do you understand the term gender violence to mean? And is it a useful term? I, I think it's kind of a cloudy term. So I, I Googled it recently. And I was just looking at what comes up first. Um, and it was a mixed bag. So I, I don't think that there's a total agreement on what the term means. So that makes me think it's not a great term to be, you know, using in, um, in, in things like, you know, government. Um, so I found it, you know, maybe rooted in, um, non-governmental organizations connected to the United Nations, where they are using it as a term about women, females being abused, basically kind of a patriarchal society kind of um, term. You know, that, that women, females are the targets of um, violence because of their gender and because of the imbalance of power in in particularly in countries that are very patriar patriarchal. Um, and then I see other, on, on that first Google page, I, I saw other um, websites, institutions using the term more broadly um, as if it could be inclusive of um, all genders. So, so that it could be males being targeted, could be females being targeted, could be um, people who've taken a gender identity, um, LGBTQ um, people, um, and that there's violence, violence against them. And, but it's specifically because of their gender. So that's another way it's being used is they're being targeted for some reason, could be multi different genders, but they're being targeted violently because of their gender. Um, so I don't know, um, I think it, it could just add to the confusion. I, I don't know that it moves it forward when we're talking about domestic violence. It moves it forward to being inclusive. Because um, again, it seems to be then, then buying into this idea that domestic violence is happening because of a person's gender. You know, it, it harkens back to that the Duluth model and patriarchy. So that is saying domestic violence is happening because the males have more power over the females. And it's specifically the gender difference that is creating that medium for the domestic violence to happen. Um, I, so I, I'd add it to my, okay, it's one of 72 reasons why domestic violence happens. It's only one. I see. Yeah, when I was uh, abused by my ex-wife, I didn't get the sense that it was because of my gender. Now, of course, my gender played a role in how everything played out. Like if the genders had been switched, you know, different police involvement, different kinds of uh, societal pressures to take different kinds of actions. But um, I didn't get the sense it was because of my gender. However, if we're going to start using gender violence to be interchangeable with domestic violence, then I'm having to decide whether I was a victim of gender violence, and in which case I'm, I'm, I'm saying that it was motivated by 
uh, my wife's, my ex-wife's sense of matriarchy or anti-patriarchy or something? Anti-patriarchy. I think that, you know, there's some, I wouldn't want it to get latched on as the only thing, but it's certainly an interesting thing to talk about and, and think about. So I think that's part of what's going on um, where women feel like it's, it's their right to hit the guy because it's women taking their power and specifically taking it uh, because men used to have it. I don't think it's moving forward to, ha to have um, gender violence be can't become the term uh, for domestic violence in general. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, to me, uh, it, it clouded things, like you said, because I wasn't sure what do you mean? I think in one case it was used as a catch-all to, to include domestic violence, uh, sex trafficking, um, some other kind of thing. And it's like, gender violence is a term that applies to all those things. Why not be specific? Because there's different causes for each one of those things, different solutions for each one of those things. If you lump them together, I, I think it does um, have the effect of people hearing it and thinking, what we're focusing on solving here is violence against females. However, that's, I suppose that can be a goal of yours, but if that's a goal of yours as a politician, you should state that outright. Yeah, yeah, the, the term is confusing, yeah. Well, this has been such a helpful and useful conversation, and thank you very much. You're, you're welcome, you're welcome. Can you tell us where would um, people find out more about you and your work and your books? Yeah, so one place is annsilvers.com, uh, no E on Anne. And uh, so I got lots of stuff on, on my website and um, you can find my books on Amazon as well. Um, one of the easiest way to find my list of books is on, actually on my blog on ansilvers.com and um, putting in the search Amazon books and it'll come up with a, a blog post about all the books that I have. So on the topic of uh, partner abuse, I've got the big book, which is Abuse of Men by Women. I kept it simple. Um, and um, then I also have booklets, like shorter books, I call the, the A Quick Look At series. And there's one on partner abuse in all gender configurations. And then also um, A Quick Look At Abuse of Men by Women. Well, you're, you're a hero of mine. Oh, you know, well, thank you. Today. Um, because like, you know, my, my focus is trying to improve things towards uh, true gender equality in the state of Washington. And you're, you're a wonderful voice towards that. I admire you. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Talk to you again. Bye. Bye-bye.